Hello, my name is Stevie Salas, and I'm going to tell you why. No, my name is Stevie Salas, and I'll tell you why. Yo, man. What? I am Mr. Endo. And let me show you why. How you doing out there? This is Stevie Salas. I'm here in New York City. I'm attempting to do a guitar instructional video today. Um, you have to bear with me. I'm a little bit slow. It's early in the morning. I've just flown in from Los Angeles. The sunglasses. I'm not trying to be a rock star. I've just got bags under my eyes because I've been out with my uh, Japanese friends uh, getting crazy here. So what I'm going to try to do today is uh, do a video that shows different rhythm techniques. Um, anybody who knows my playing knows that I base almost all my songwriting, all my, all my playing around rhythm, whether it's a straight rock and roll rhythm or straight up funk rhythm. So today I'm going to try to go through some different patterns of rhythm from funk to metal. And I'm going to um, show you the different ways that I approach it sound-wise, even uh, the way I've approached it on a few different songs from different records of mine. And also I'll be having an amazing rhythm section today. I'll be playing with T.M. Stevens on bass, who most of you probably know him. He's one of the best bass players in the world. He's played with everybody from Miles Davis, James Brown, to uh, The Pretenders, and Steve Vai. Um, also, a friend of mine, David Friendly, who's played on and off with me over the years, will be playing drums, who's a songwriting partner of mine and, uh, and a great drummer percussion player. And we're going to be here uh, just trying to demonstrate a few things. And hopefully, uh, at the end of the hour, you'll uh, know a little bit more about how I play my rhythm and uh, how I approach the sound of the rhythm. And also, maybe uh, you won't be too bored. So yo, I'm here tonight to, uh, today to talk to you about um, rhythm technique, funk rock rhythm technique actually. 
Um, I've, I've never want, I've never made one of these videos before, and I always shied away from it because I've always figured since I've never taken a lesson, I really didn't have much to say. I watch these videos, and a lot of people talk about technical things. I don't really know the names of chords. I don't really know what notes I'm playing, but I'll try to show you a few ideas and, and how I come up with hearing them. Um, I'm going to try to show you a few ideas now. Like, say, I'll, I'll take a groove, and I'll try to show you like how to how I could play you know power chords over it like uh, heavy metal sound and power chords for instance or some different really funk grooves or some different kind of in between funky grooves um, since I, I started my career playing uh, with George Clinton really he was the first person I ever recorded with rhythm is something that I incorporate in all my songwriting and all my playing whether it's a metal song or you know or something for say Sash Jordan or something for Rod Stewart or something for for anybody that I work with you know, for T.M. Stevens, even. Everything I do has got to sort of a, have a feel of rhythm to it. Um, some people could call it funky. Some people just call it rhythm. I just call it music myself. It's just the way I play. So I'll try to demonstrate here. Then the bass line would be something like this, let's say. Uh, then maybe I would take like a funk guitar part and I'll do like a... And maybe I'll take like a little bit of a, a wah-wah part, let's just say, from my... You guys get a picture of my new chrome Jimmy, Jimmy Dunlap wah-wah here you just sent me tonight? So, uh, something maybe like this. Maybe something like that. And maybe I'll get the fellas here together and we'll like, try a little bit of a demonstration. And, and during that, I'll also bust into some... Uh, some power chords and try to make it sort of all feel heavy and then get funky at the same time and sort of uh, see how that works. So there I tried to show um, how the guitar can change the feel of the whole track. Even though the drums and the bass are primarily playing the, so the same thing all the way through, if I want to lighten up the... Or if I want to play... If I want to play either part, it sort of changes the whole dynamic of the track. And I feel that... Uh, but all parts are very rhythmic, even if they're just power chords. But they all sort of show you, you know, what you can do with a song with just different rhythm parts.
Now, in this uh, demonstration, I'm going to go ahead and uh, try to lock into a slow hypnotic rhythm, something that's really fat, like something really on the back. But I'm going to try to bust in and out of some different lines. And also, I'm going to try to mess around with showing soloing with a bit of rhythm technique. Because I, I don't think anybody can be a good soloist unless they can play good rhythm. I think too many times people spend too much time learning licks. And, and if they could just learn time, their stuff would sound a lot more fluent. Um, so I'm going to try to st st try to lock the fellas into something here that's a little bit real slow and hypnotic. And then um, bust in and out of some different parts. And we'll see what happens. <coughs> What I'm going to try to do is to show how you take a bit of rhythm and you can kind of go in and out of the leads. In a minute, I'll also do some stuff with the fellas where we start a slow groove and we'll do that as well. But at this time, I'll try to show just how you create a couple of uh, little pieces and go in and out of soloing and keep the rhythm going. <laughs> show it. <laughs> now, part of the like, rhythm technique and, uh, of soloing and playing rhythm at the same time, I think most solos, like I've said a million times, are based around rhythm anyway. It's very rhythmic. and You can come in and out of chords and in and out of solos at the same time very easily. Um, what I like to do live, let's say, is um, 
See, I, I like to play my funk through Marshalls. You know, some people like to play their funk through different things. I like to, see, to me, I like to, I think a Marshall or a, a big, loud, distorted amp is the only way to go because you got to have punch and headroom. And what I like to do is sort of the old way. I'll get the amp where if you put it down here like this, and it's kind of big and nasty sounding. I like to flip it up to the front pickup maybe, and I just back the volume down just a little bit, and all of a sudden... And it's got all this body, right, and all this sort of texture. So it makes it easy when you want to solo and play rhythm because you can just back your volume down. You can sit there and just put your volume up, get a little bit more grease on it, and then bring it back down and start funking. And it's sort of the same way I play that. I do my rock and roll, everything, you know, whether I'm playing it on. If I want to play something like... Uh, then I back it down a little for the while I start singing. Kind of just tightens it up. I use this volume control a lot, and it helps me when I want to solo. I just kick it up, and it sort of gives me a little extra edge, you know? But the, the whole idea of coming up and playing rhythmically and, and funkin' is sort of like something that guy's been doing for years, like uh, Funkadelic, for instance. If you go see George Clinton and Funkadelic in concert, you'll see walls of marshals. You won't see little baby amps playing with that clean sound. See, I ain't down with that. People that uh, want, to, want to play the funk like this and they get a clean sound and they just kind of go... <laughs> see, I think that is total bullshit, you know? I think a mug's got to go... <laughs> You got to dig in, you know, you got to use the amp, you got to use the power of the amp. So do yourself a favor, go watch Funkadelic in concert anywhere in the country or in the world that you're at, and, you, and you'll get a lesson, or go watch Bootsy Collins' band, uh, Rubber Band in concert, and you'll see that the funk should be played, not direct in the studio. You should mic an amp every time, whether it's an old Fender or an old Marshall or something like that, mic that amp, and uh, that's the way you should do it, always. George Clinton said it's a, it's the, a sin against funk to uh, play your funk guitar direct in the studio, so don't ever do that. Always use your amp. Back it down a little bit on your rhythm pickup. And you can know. And you can know. That easy. Now, I was think, talking also about playing different styles of rhythm and, and, uh, and funk style rhythm and other types of music as well. Um, like I said, I always try to incorporate uh, that rhythm style in anything I do. Let's say, for instance, uh, you take a, a piece that, like, uh, say something I would play with Rod Stewart. You know, there's a real art to uh, playing something as basic as, uh, you know, something like... <laughs> funky and it's very basic you know a lot of people forget that uh, that stuff has got a lot of pocket to it you know if you listen to a lot of those old records and it's not really a funk record you know if you heard that song on the radio that's it's not a funk record or a dance record or anything stupid like that it's just a rock song it's just I think people played with more rhythm before you know I actually talked to Ronnie Wood before not to name drop it or take care of your shoes there I just dropped a big name on him but Ronnie would uh, just come in and not think about it he'd play these parts and then he'd turn around and in the same amp he'd plug in the bass and do the bass part so people I think think too much now it's Another way you can do is uh, something like a... I mean, that's really funky, you know? It's not just going... I'm, tr I'm trying to play it bad, it's, it's hard. But I mean, it's an art to the, to the pump, you know, how it swings. So anything you do should have sort of a swagger swing to it, no matter what type of music, you know? from uh, metal to anything. You know, you, if you make it a little bit funky, you put a little rhythm in it, it's always gonna have a little bit more of a vibe to it. M musical influences, take one. Hmm, you know, the history of my uh, musical career is sort of uh, funny. Um, I feel like a thousand-year-old man and uh, wrapped up in a 30-year-old body. I. Um, 
I started off as a kid playing in San Diego, and I'm a self-taught musician. I learned by going and watching other musicians play and sort of trying to steal their ideas. Then I would go home and grab my guitar and try to emulate what I saw them do, and then somehow in the translation, it would, you know, it would create something different. It's still the same way I play. I pretty much, I, I'm, I'm a sponge. I, I sponge in everything I can from every musician, whether, you know, I'm sitting there watching Keith Richards play or I'm watching uh, some guy in a, in a bar in New Orleans, you know, no matter what style or what, how famous or whatever, everybody I watch, I, uh, and I, the whole time I'm watching, I'm, st I'm stealing, I'm a thief. So if I come and see you play sometime and uh, you don't want me to steal your licks, don't play them for me because I will definitely steal them. But that's the way I learned how to play. I grew up in San Diego. I moved to Los Angeles, and I got my first break, of course. Uh, um, I was homeless, and I was sleeping on a couch in a studio, and uh, I met George Clinton from uh, Parliament Funkadelic, and George had me play on his uh, album R&B Skeletons, and through that I met Bootsy Collins, and which later led to my band with Bootsy Collins, uh, Third Eye, with um, Buddy Miles. And, but uh, then I, uh, you know, I became a staff producer for David Kirschenbaum and uh, produced Was Not Was and scored some movies and then joined Rod Stewart and then my first color code recording contract. That's sort of my whole history wrapped in, into a little package. Uh, lately, I've been spending much more time uh, um, concentrating on projects other than myself. I mean, projects that include myself, such as the Electric Pow Wow album with Zach Wilde and Richie Kotzen or the Third Eye album with Buddy Miles and Bootsy Collins or... Ronald Shannon Jackson's album Electric Warrior with uh, Bill Laswell. Um, trying to, just trying to broaden my horizon as a musician. Now I want to talk to you a bit about uh, what I think is one of the most important elements of playing rhythm guitar and, and, and playing funky really is a wah-wah pedal. A lot of people have them, a lot of people use them. I probably overuse them. I mean, I use them, if you ever hear any records I'm playing on, it's like I almost always use the wah-wah pedal. I consider the wah-wah pedal almost like an extension of my body. Um, it helps me to to get across feelings that I'm feeling. It, 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 it has a lot of emotion in it, the wah-wah pedal. I know that sounds corny. The same as a, a wang bar. This one's broken right now because I broke it, but when I use it, usually it's not just to go, you know, use a dive bomb. It's usually, in a, you know, a, a, out of a feeling of... Uh, you know, anger or anything, I can just, you can make it thing sound like it's dying, I'm torturing it, you know. Uh, the wah-wah pedal can be beautiful as well as it can be really ugly, you know. It's, uh... So now this wah-wah is, uh, is my new wah-wah I just got. It's a new Jim Dunlap wah-wah. I have all sorts. I probably have 20, 25 different wah-wah pedals uh, because each one is very different. And um, I like to use the Crybabies on tour. They sound amazing. And this is the newest one they just made for me. I believe these are going to be on sale pretty soon. Uh, this one has like four different wah-wahs in one, different styles of envelope and sweep and things. And a wah-wah, like I said, you can, you, can take something, you can take something really soft and beautiful and, you know. Or you can take it, you know, and you can kind of light it up a bit. You know, you can kind of get ugly with it, too. Sometimes you, if you want, I got this little box here. You can only get them in Japan, I think. And it's like a little toy. But Bill Laswell, actually, a producer, when I was making an album with Buddy Miles and Bootsy Collins, got one for me and one for Bernie Worrell. And it's sort of a fake, like a simulated wah-wah. And you can set it to make give you automatic wah-wah, so you can kind of go, it's called an envelope filter. You kind of got the closed wah-wah sound, and you hit it hard, and it gets a little funkier. <laughs> And that thing's really cool for rhythm too, because you can do some stuff like a. Uh... And if you, if, I'll open it up a little bit more and show you even some funkier stuff. Mm -hmm. 
So you can make it down, play real soft. And... and then it's really nasty. This thing's really killer. So usually sometimes I'll take the wah-wahs and I'll overdrive them and I'll distort them. And I'll, and I'll kind of push the signal through. <laughs> that sounds really ridiculous here, but if you listen to any of my records and you'll hear different feedbacks and sometimes I'll distort the wah-wah through, through phase shifters and stuff and it creates like really bizarre effects. And so if you ever hear how I'm, me getting really bizarre feedbacks and songs on my records, that's usually what I'm doing. I'm usually controlling the wah-wah to it with heavy amounts of gain, you know, in those frequencies distorting the amplifier and you know, blowing up speakers and stuff. So to me, the wah wah is is the best. Uh, you know, if I had to go out on the road and I only could take one effect, it would definitely be the wah wah pedal.
my influences uh, are so varied. Uh, as a musician, I constantly try to to be influenced by by other musicians, but more so by by other styles of things. I can be influenced by a, a singer, but it may influence the way I play my guitar. Influenced by a drum beat, Tony Thompson's drumming, for instance, always influenced the way I played guitar. Um, so my influences are much, much more than just like me listening to Eddie Van Halen, which of course I did when very much when I was a kid. Um, I try now to be influenced by um, by things around me other than than just music even. So I know that probably makes no sense to you, but um, also um, during the last couple of years, I've been. Uh, I know that some of the people, in, especially in Japan, probably been upset. I haven't been concentrating on making my color code records. I'm, I was saying with my electric powwow records, I also took some time to play with other musicians, such as Sash Jordan, a female singer who I've also produced and write with, and, and uh, Terrence Trent Darby, who's an old friend of mine. And being on stage with, uh, say, Terrence Trent Darby in front of 20,000 people, to me, he's one of the most magnificent singers I've ever heard. And every night he could sing something that would completely inspire the way I would play guitar that night. So um, also working with, you know, the. You, you sit in a room with Bootsy Collins or you sit in a room with Terrence Trent Darby. By the time you decide to go back in the studio and make another solo album or create something or write a song, you, you can suck in all that, those different styles, what these other people do, and, and try to emulate them through your instrument. And uh, that's sort of what I do. I think what I want to do is I'm going to sh show you a bit to how I would layer a song, let's say, in the studio. I'll take a groove here. And I'll play, let me think, there's one, two. I'll play two different parts, and I'll show you how I put them together in the studio. And then I'll go ahead and do it a third time and show you how I sort of play all the parts together live to sort of, sort of make up for what's missing on uh, the album. Because, of course, on the album, usually there's tons of different guitar parts, and, you know, you can only play one, really. So I'm going to show you how I sort of try to bastardize the version of this so I could play both. Okay, let's go ahead and come in on the groove. And I'm going to start with first with the little simple funk part that I played. I had the, you know, the little Fender amp going in the studio, and this is the part I played. So now that's the funk part. Now I'm gonna go and play what the heavy part was on the on the actual track. One, two, three. Okay, so that was the heavy part. Now what I'll try to do is a. Uh, show you what I did on tour and how I try to make them both work. What I end up doing is holding the, um, the actual bass note down with my finger and taking my pinky and kind of hitting this note, which kind of makes it some bastardized chord. I, some chord person could tell you what it is. I myself don't know. And I'm not saying it's a good thing not to know your chords and your theory, but then again, who cares? <laughs> One, two, three.
And there you have it, the cheater's way. <laughs> now, sometimes, like uh, in the studio, uh, very often, I'm trying to, trying to be this way less and less as I go on in my career, but especially when I was younger. I would put parts down, and then I would put other parts down, and there's no way I could recreate them live. I would have to figure out ways to recreate or just do one or two parts. Like, for instance, uh, it was like... Uh, And I decided to do an acoustic version of the song, to do that song acoustically um, in concert. It, was, it didn't sound good that way, so I would, I would you know, change the more of the feels with it. Sort of changing the whole feel so I could play that song acoustically live in concert differently than what I played it in the studio on the studio album. Because um, obviously the same approach wouldn't work. The same thing happens with stand up, and a little bit I'm gonna play with the fellas and show you how I put all the parts together, being like a. And then the main part being. Playing them together is sort of like a. That's sort of like the way I could put them both together um, to sort of cover the parts and simulate the funkiness as well as the heaviness, you know? The one thing I, I'd like to point out, though, now that when I'm in the studio, I used to have a complete different approach. I used to think of the studio as one animal and live concerts the other. Um, starting out, not getting to tour much, and, and uh, you know, I had my band in high school and then went on to um, join... Um, Rod Stewart really being my first band I ever joined as a kid and starting out in football stadiums. I never had a chance to really learn about growing a, my live sound and studio sound. It's just like, you know, one was one and the other was the other and I didn't seem to know how to make them work. Now, instead of cutting different parts like that, I usually try in the studio to use the same exact approach. Uh, I try to use the same style of amplifiers and the same kind of funky pedals and the same approach I do with my volume here, backing it off when I want to get a good funky sound. And, and then turning it up when I want to go, when I want to get kind of nasty. And so I think it's a, good, it's a good way to think. If you can figure out a way to make your studio stuff kind of sound just like your live stuff, I think at the end of the day it's going to be a lot better and a lot more natural sounding and not so processed sounding. Um, I'm really about anti-processing. I like to use weird sound effects and weird screwed up noises, but all, all in the normal natural way. You know, I may take a guitar and beat on the springs to make it make funny noises through the amp, but I'm really not that into uh, using walls and walls of uh, effects and stuff to achieve what you need to achieve. And then usually live, all that stuff ends up sounding like crap anyways. If you're playing anywhere with any size, you're not going to hear any of those things. So that is my, my main goal now, but I'll go back to the other thing now.
Okay, well, there's my video. Um, hopefully you're not asleep right now. Hopefully you're not too bored. And maybe, uh, hopefully you learned a little something um, that'll help you uh, in your guitar playing in the future. My future, on the other hand, will include uh, you know, more uh, touring around the world. Hopefully to Japan very soon. I haven't been there in a while. I'm really, really uh, excited about going back. I want to come back and do a color code tour. I want to come back also with Sash Jordan. I'd like to also even try to come back and do a, do a third eye tour with Bootsy and Buddy Miles if we can get the time. I'm going to be spending the next few months on the road um, just uh, doing my thing. I, I hope that, uh, you know, all the guitar kids out there who watch this video in Japan or anywhere else in the world can remember that uh, it's not really all about being a rock star, but uh, it's all about trying to think about being a musician. And then if you make good records, then all that other stuff will come later. So forget all the cheese and get down to the pocket. Yo.